Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session. Um, my name is Mafia. I'm going to be delivering today's webinar, and I'm incredibly excited. Maps are one of my biggest passions, so I'm really, really keen to show you and guide you through the basics of mapping with Flourish. So before we start, if you've joined us before, if you've come to any of the other webinars um, prior to this one, you might be used to us simply, you know, explaining these things to you and um, inviting you to sit back and enjoy the session as it is recorded and this one will be recorded as well. However, um, for this one in particular, I will invite you if you want to follow along and map with me, um, you should head over to flourish.studio um, slash resources slash data sets. I think Luisa is going to paste the link in the chat in a second, but the data that we're going to be demoing today um, can be found in that link. So actually, if I just quickly head over there and show you that in a second. And it should be this file, the mapping101.zip. Um, all the information, all the data sets that we're going to be demoing today can be found there. Um, so, you know, it can take a minute or two, download it. And by the end of today's session, hopefully this will keep you excited. You're going to be able to create this very map as it loads. There we go. We're going to be working with this astonishing um, animated map by the end of today's session. So, you know, there's a lot of theory that I'm going to go over. Um, there are some bits that might be a bit of, like complicated at the beginning, but hopefully by the end of it, everything will make sense. You will feel more comfortable working with maps in Flourish. And, and yes, you will finish with this map on your end as well, hopefully. So in today's session, um, we're going to be going over the basics of, of mapping. So this is just basic theory. Um, common to any mapping tool that you might use to create your maps with. Then I'm going to key, to go over mapping in Flourish. So these principles might be specific to our tool and might not be fully transferable to other um, cartographic tools, but should be useful nonetheless. We're going to learn how to create a core plus map today, how to make a point map and a proportional symbol map. And throughout the whole session, I'm going to be going over tips, tricks, and how to troubleshoot um, when you're creating and working with maps in Flourish. And as Luisa said at the very beginning, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. I'm going to make um, my best to just check the chat regularly and stop from time to time if you need time to catch up or if you have any pressing questions. Um, but without further ado, let's just get started with the basics of mapping. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is when should we actually use a map? Maps are not perfect for every type of data and they're not e perfect for every scenario. So we should remember this rule of thumb that is that when the spatial dimension of our data matters more than other dimensions, then we should use a map. And this should help you um, throughout your charting process whenever you're wondering which chart type should you use. And if you're considering using maps, this should be a good idea um, or a good principle to keep in mind. So let's, what does this mean, right? It's like, what does the spatial dimension mean in this context? So as an example, if you wanted to visualize data from the wildfires in Australia in 2019, for, ex for instance, what would you do? Would you go straight for a map or would you actually consider other visualization types? So the answer is, it depends, of course. Um, if you wanted to focus on the most affected areas by the fires, probably a map would be a really good idea as you could position the different fires on the surface and then people could see the density, they could see the frequency of the fires like by the positioning and so on and so forth. But if you're actually more keen on showcasing which date had most incidents or most events, then probably a bar chart would suffice. So as you can see, maps are not the solution for every situation you encounter, and it simply depends. Now, let's go over what makes or composes a map. And I've divided this in three elements. So maps would always have to have these three basic elements. First is the base map. This is the canvas. This is when you're plotting your data, right? This is the terrain, um, it's the country, it's the world, is the ocean, is whatever you're trying to plot your data into. Then we have symbols and regions. This is how our data is plotted. Um, this means that these are our colored regions or the symbols we position atop the map um, that are conveying more information. And lastly, we have the legend and the scale. And these are really important elements that provide context to our map and especially help our readers understand what is it that we're trying to tell them. So for the base map, we need to take into consideration two elements, which are the projection and the coordinate system. So projections are basically the ways in which we draw the Earth, right? And you can see in this card's visualization right here, 
um, which is actually available in one of our help docs that I'm sure Luisa is going to share in the in a moment. And if not, we do have all the resources at the end of the slides. Um, as I just said, the world can be um, plotted or let's say drawn in very different ways. And every projection is going to have some pros and some cons. All depends on what you want to show and what type of areas you want to highlight and what you're focusing on. So selecting a projection really is going to determine how your data is going to look once you plot it on a map. And it's a really important step. And we're going to understand how this works and how it's, it matters and why it matters when we jump into the editor. And the second element that is really important to keep in mind is the coordinate system. The coordinate system um, determines how we position things in the space. Um, this is incredibly important for the case um, of Flourish and any mapping tool that you use. And in particular, we use latitude and longitude in decimal format. Um, this is really, really important. We see a lot of users sometimes struggling, trying to position points on a map, and they can't because they are in a different um, coordinate system. Perhaps they have degrees. So if you see a coordinate that is um, 43, like 43 degrees symbol and then north or south, um, that kind of coordinate is not actually going to work in Flourish. You need to have them, um, as it is on the screen, in decimal degrees. So that means that anything that is below the equator would be in negative degrees, and anything that is on the Western Hemisphere would be also in negative degrees. And one thing that always helps me, I do this every single day when I'm plotting, um, when I'm mapping, you can think about latitude as the lines that go like, like, like a ladder, so up and down, and they're the horizontal lines that split the Earth above and below the equator. And the longitude are like the long lines that go vertically that split the Earth in Western and Eastern Hemisphere. And you can see that in this little diagram right here. So moving on, we have the next element of our maps, which are the symbols and the regions. And this is how we plot our data, right? This is how we add information to our map and actually convey um, numerical or categorical information. So for the regions, we can color them um, either categorically or numerically, as it would be the case of this map right here. And for the symbols, we are positioning them on top of the canvas on top of the base map, and we can choose between circles, spikes, or arrows in Flourish. Maybe other tools have different symbols, but these are the ones that we provide. And we can size them either equally, so all the points are going to be the same size across the map, or proportionally based on a numeric value. And again, we can color them either categorically or numerically. And the last element is the legend and the scale. And as I said earlier, this is to provide context. This is to help your readers understand the data that you plot on your map. So first we have the color scale. And the color scale can be numerical or categorical. It is numerical when we go from a range of values and we color from lightest to darkest, meaning by the increase in magnitude, or categorical if we simply have a series of categories, classifications um, that are not quantifiable and we just want to split our symbols or regions by that. They can be sequential or diverging. Sequential means that we go, say, on a straight line, and we start from an X value on to another X value, and we just go like straight in that range of values. Or diverging, and this means that we have a natural breakdown that splits our data set in half. It doesn't necessarily have to be zero. It can be an average. It can be a specific threshold. And then we color from to one side or to the other. So in this example, for instance, our baseline is zero and we color anything that is negative in red and anything that is positive in blue. And the last um, color scale would be, or the last classification for the color scale would be to be either continuous or a bend. So a continuous scale, again, goes over all the elements in our range and it basically splits the data accordingly as it is in that spectrum. However, the bend um, legend actually creates kind of like compartments that you want to input your different, um, all your data points into one of those specific bins. So if you have, for instance, only four bins, then all your values are going to be colored only by those four specific categories. And last, we do have the symbol scale, um, which helps providing context to the audience by giving it some sort of range into how big the icons are on, well, or the symbols are on our map, right? So here we have, for instance, an example of the legend um, on the spikes. So we can see what a spike of value 50 looks like compared to a value 200. And we can see what a circle value 17.5 is compared to a value 70. Now, 
um, the types of maps that we're going to be covering today all draw from these three elements that I've mentioned. We have the choropleth map, the point map, and the proportional symbol map. So the choropleth map, you've probably seen this before, even if you don't call it a choropleth map. Um, the point of these maps is to convey value through colored regions by a numeric value. Um, they're really good to provide quick, quick glances at the data. People are very good at grasping, you know, what areas have a bigger magnitude because of the darker shade um, compared to areas with a lighter shade. However, um, they have a drawback, which is that um, our eyes as humans, like our visual perception, we're skewed towards bigger areas. So even if in our map we have a very small portion of it that has a concentration of values, just because it's a bit smaller than others, um, our eyes are going to be drawn to the bigger areas. And this sometimes can be a drawback and it sometimes can make it difficult to actually um, convey your information. So choropleth maps might not always be the way to go. Then we have the point map and point maps convey information by the positioning of the symbols. In this case, the symbols are all sized the same, so they don't convey value in that manner. And they're really good to show density and clusters. We can clearly see where are all the dots located or the spikes, and we can just like gather information in that way. However, a drawback is that it can get bis um, too busy visually, and especially if you have big clusters, then it can be really hard to differentiate one from the next. And I guess an evolution or a continuation from the point map would be the proportional symbol map, which is exactly the same principle. You position symbols on top of your map, and then you size them proportionally to a value. So you convey information by position and sizing. And again, it is really good for showing density and magnitude, but it can be difficult to make comparisons sometimes, especially because, again, humans are not great at differentiating different areas. So if you're interested in mapping, perhaps you've read that sometimes comparing different circles and the sizes in the areas of different circles on this type of maps can be hard. And that sometimes humans don't even, we're not really that great at assessing whether a symbol is four times bigger or two times bigger than another one. So again, these are all things to keep in mind whenever you're choosing a map for your data. And in order to help you with that, actually, um, yeah, so in order to help you with that, we actually wrote a blog to go over the different types of maps that you can build with Flourish and the drawbacks of each of them, how to create them, what are they good for, and a lot of tips and tricks. And you can see that in our blog. There's a link in the slides, and I'm sure they're going, there's going to be a link in the chat very soon. So now let's get started with actual flourish mapping. And I see that there's a question in the chat about dot density map option. We do have a heat map option. And actually, we're going to be demoing that today. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but it is part of the, um, the program, so to speak. It is part of the, um, the topics that we're going to be covering today. But now let's take a look at how we can map in flourish. So we have over five templates to help you with mapping. We have the, pro the projection map, 3D map, marker map, arc map, and data explorer. And this is a really brief explanation on what each of these does. The projection map is really good for shading regions. It allows you to upload your own um, base. So if you have a GeoJSON file and you want to create your own map in a specific region, you can do that. And you can choose between different projections. So it's very, very helpful. And it is probably it's one of the most used templates that we have at Flourish. Then we have the 3D map which allows you to create animated maps. You can also create heat maps, um, extrude regions, and it has a bigger um, data processing power than the projection map. So if you have really big data sets, you might want to go over the 3D map. We have the marker map as well. And this one is really good if you, for instance, want to plot um, points in your data and want to add a picture or use an emoji, you can do that with the marker map. You couldn't do that with the other two maps. So you can't, for instance, add custom symbols to the projection map but you can do so with um, this particular template. And then we have the arc map, which is only used to, well, create arc maps, meaning that we are connecting two points in our surface with a, an arc, and then we can make those arc as, thing, as thick or thin as our data. And the data explorer is part of our premium templates. And the main, um, or the main characteristic of this um, template is that it allows you to morph between bubbles to actual, um, to a map region. So it is visually very appealing, but again, it's one of our premium templates. In any case, today we're going to be covering projection map and 3D map. And this 
will allow you to do roughly 90% of all the things you want to do with maps. Really, these two as a combination are very, very powerful. So this has been the formal introduction of all the theory that we're going to be covering for this webinar. But now let's take a look at um, our data, shall we? I'm going to jump into the folder in a second, but here's a quick overview. We have two data sets. One is hardisease.csv. This is basically, um, it's hard disease deaths in the United States. You have a total deaths per state column, total population per state, and also death per 10,000 people per state. Then we have the earthquakes data set, and this contains every single earthquake in, well, as far as the USGS and the US Geological Survey has recorded from the year 2000 until 2023 by the end of January. So we're not covering the recent events, um, the recent earthquakes in February. We have a um, two coordinate columns for each event. So a latitude and a longitude. We have the magnitude of the event and we have the time. And the weirdest file probably that you will see in that little um, folder is a JSON file. This is for tectonic plate boundaries. We're going to see what that means in a second. And if you're puzzled by what JSON means, it's just a way of storing data. So um, don't worry too much about it. If you're curious, we can chat about that later by the end of the session, but um, it's, it's simply a different way of storing data, different, for instance, for a CSV. So very quickly, if I go to my, there we go. So if you download the data from um, the Flourish site, you should be presented then with this five um, file types. We have the earthquakes, heart disease, sources. So you can take a look at where this data comes from and even explore the data yourself and the tectonic plates .chase. So we are going to start with how to create a choropleth map. That is the first map that we're going to um, be looking at. And these are the things that we're going to be learning from this exercise, okay? First, I'm going to introduce the Flourish projection map template to you. If you're new to Flourish, if you never used it, this is um, welcome. This is going to be the first time you're going to be looking into the data tab, the preview tab, and all of the different Flourish elements. We're going to select the right color scale for our data. We're going to add some pop-ups, and we're going to talk a little bit about absolute values versus rates and why they matter in this particular chart type. So, oop, that was a little bit of a spoiler. There we go. So let me just move to the editor in a sec. Okay, there we go. So, um, I believe, uh, yeah, I think Luisa just pasted the link to the data set again, but if you need to find it, it's in flourish.studio-resources-datasets. So now we're going to create our um, carpleth map. And for that, we need to go to our Flourish profile and create new visualization. And because I'm going to be dealing with United States and just US states, I need to use the United States um, starting point. So I click on that. And again, if you've never, if you're new to Flourish and you never use one of our templates, all of our templates come with pre-populated data. Um, and this is to help you understand what you need to do, how the data should be formatted, and to give you a glimpse on what your map would look like. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can all see in my screen. Okay, grand. And then let's head into the data tab. So before I even input my data or anything, let's just take a quick overview on what it's happening in the data tab, which is basically given all the information to the Flourish template on how to render our data and how to actually plot our map. So the first sheet is our regions sheet. And this is the sheet where you're going to parse the data that is the regions. So in this case, we're coloring our regions by population, meaning that in this sheet, I have all my population values. Uh, we can take a quick look at the bindings here, which are, again, speaking to the different elements of our template, and then they're making sure that I'm plotting the data however I want to. The georegion key um, is a really important column, and it's the column that needs to match a value in the region's geometry key, okay? One thing you really need to um, remember whenever you're plotting with the projection map template is that the regions of your map live separate in this region's geometry sheet, okay? So in this case, I'm dealing with the United States and my, um, and say like my, my units, right? Like the base map that I'm creating, it's composed of different states. 
So every single row in this data set represents the state. If I were plotting, for instance, the world, every row in this data set would be a country. And if I'm plotting just a small state, for instance, I would have counties or any other sort of geographical um, subdivision. And in this sheet, I need to have this geometry. And then I have columns that are actually um, connecting to the regions sheet. Okay, so it's really important that these two sheets have one common field so they can sort of speak to each other and you're able to actually plot your values on the map. So, oh, well, let me just go over the other two um, sheets as well. The points sheet um, contains all the information for the symbols on your map. So in this case, this would be latitude and longitude primarily. This is the main thing that you need to plot your points. And if you wanted to color them or size them by other columns, then you should have your categories column or your numeric column to um, edit that as well. But we're going to be looking at that in a second. So I'm actually going to clear this sheet. And if I do that, you can see here that I no longer have any points whatsoever. And the line sheet in this case is gonna be empty, but here's where we would add, for instance, um, railway data, boundaries, any sort of thing that you wanted to plot as a line to your map. Now, I'm going to clear these. And for those of you who are following along, now it's time to upload our data. And for that, we just need to click on this button, upload data. I'm going to the file, my to my little mapping 101 folder, and I'm going to click harddisease.csv and I'm going to open it. And I'm going to import it and continue. So let's take a quick look at what's happening here. This is our data set and we have the name of a state, we have the code of a state, the census area, which is actually the geographical area, the surface of each of the states, the IGO ID, the FIPS, which again, it's the similar, it's the same as the state number, um, but in a separate column in case you needed that. Total deaths by heart disease related conditions, the total population per state, and the deaths um, per 10,000 people, um, 10,000, yeah, the, the rate of per 10,000 people of heart related um conditions so flourish will try its best to map whatever you have on your data tab and create automatic column bindings and this is to help you make the charting process easier but it doesn't always get it right so if i actually go into my preview here it sort of tried to create a weird map with my columns but it's not actually doing the best job so i'm just going to get rid of that and do it manually so first things first, my geo region key, which is the column that is going to be connecting my regions sheet and my regions geometry. And I'm going to select name because here I have a name and they are the same. And I know that that is working because in my preview, I am rendering a map. If my data sets did not have a common field, nothing would, plot, no, nothing would be plot in here. I wouldn't be getting anything. And we can test that theory by going very quickly to the region, region's geometry. And for instance, let's find Texas. Where's Texas? Should be somewhere here. There we go. Row 16, Texas. So let's change this name to say, I don't know, T. If I go into my preview, we can see that that disappears because it's not finding a common field between the two sheets to kind of like speak to each other. So this is really important and that's why you need the common field. I'm just going to bring that back and go back to my regions. So here, I'm gonna plot total deaths. And I'm gonna do that by binding that column to the color by. And with that, I get this map. Let's see what Flourish has done. So I already have a legend that is plotting the minimum value and the maximum. I have my regions shaded by the number of deaths on each of the states, and this is all looking quite nice. So, um, now let's go over the settings and see what else can we do to improve this map. First is the projection, which I mentioned earlier, um, which is, it has to do with how we draw the earth, right? So here we're selecting all versus USA because it is the most um, used and common projection to plot the United States. But what happens, for instance, if I use all 30 and 45 degrees? So this is actually going to give me a more realistic view of how things actually look on Earth 
because we all know that Alaska is now down here. We know that Hawaii is not here and that Puerto Rico is a bit further away from Florida than it shows on the other projections. But this is quite a harsh view and it's not necessarily the best view to plot information on the United States, which is why we generally choose this projection um, instead. So why is this important? Because you can see how different projections actually may have some drawbacks or pros and cons and may skew data and you know they may be problematic in some points. So um, learning all about projections is like it's part of the journey of doing like maps and doing cartography, but it's important to keep in mind that different projections will deliver a different message. But now let's focus on improving this map. So going to the regions layer, this, there are a couple of things that we can do. Let me actually turn my theme to none so we can all be looking at the same thing. If you're joining this webinar and you're part of a company, you probably are seeing all of this with your theme. So your screen and my screen might be looking slightly different. So just keep that in mind. So let's look at our regions, shall we? Here we can change the palette that we're using to shade our regions by. And because we're dealing with um, hard conditions, I think the red might be a better choice of color. You can change that to any other option that we have provided here. You can reverse that. So instead of going from lighter to darker, it can go from darker to lighter if your data is suitable for that. A couple more things we can do here is, for instance, we can change the outlines of the states. So in this case, maybe they're not incredibly clear. So let me, for instance, make them darker by going to the outline section and just um, opening the color panel. So now my regions are, for instance, um, colored in black on the outline and they might be a bit easier to read. And again, I'm aware that this is a lot of information at once. I'm trying to go over the very, very basic things that you will need to create any map. So if I'm missing anything, um, I mean, ask away in the chat, please. And But I'm just trying to kind of like cater as much as I can to um, a really wide audience. And there's a lot of you joining today. So again, just keep that in mind, please. So more things that we can do in the regions layer is that we can actually show labels. So these labels are going to match the ones that are bound here on the label. And I actually don't have anything bound. So let me bound my column A right here. And now I should be exactly looking into the, um, the name of every single one of the states. That is perfect. And we can do a couple of things in here to style our map further. We can set the labels to be uppercase if we want them or sentence case. We can make them bold or not. And we can change the size, for instance, to one and the outline to have a bigger, a thinner or a slimmer outline. I'm going to keep it 20. And now we can do something with the label priority, which is going to prioritize some labels over others. So this happens when you have a lot of things going on in your map and maybe some la labels clash the labels priority is going to help you select the labels that are most important and hide the labels that you don't want to ever show. So say for instance, that I don't want to show Kansas. If I put that into hide labels, this is never going to pop up. And with label priority, I'm going to add California, Texas, Florida, and New York. And initially nothing is gonna change. But if I actually click on this little toggle, only shows lab only show labels on label priority list, I'm going to only get the labels in that list. And that is another way to, you know, make sure that you are only showing the elements that are actually helping convey information to your map. One last thing that I'm noticing here is that my pop-ups are looking slightly weird because I'm getting this string of numbers instead of the name of the state. So I'm quickly going to go over my data and see what's going on name it's god and that is not what i want i want a so if i change that now my pop-ups which are automatically generated by flourish have the name of the state and the total number of deaths the last thing that i can do or well last couple of things i can go to my legends layer right here and this is going to create and control all the settings on the legend right here i'm going to add a custom title and i'm going to say total deaths. Now I have a legend with an actual title. And last but not least, I'm going to add a title, title to my chart, which is always something useful for maps, especially. So this is total deaths 
first aid, and this is heart related conditions. Okay, so this is our first map. Let me get rid of these sources. And this data comes from the CDC. So I'm just going to add that there. And if I had a link, I would add it over here. So now we're going to add this to a story. So if you, again, never plotted with Flourish before, stories are our own sort of slideshow. They're a way to connect different charts with each other. And we can create one by clicking on this little button here. So I'm just going to create story. And this is going to automatically add my chart into this new view. I'm going to just add a story, I'm um, sorry, a title for plus map very quickly. And very quickly, if I click on my visualization right here, I am able to open that again. So now I have my story on one um, tab in my browser and my chart on another. And I'm going to add a title for clarity. And now I want to duplicate this. So if I duplicate this, this new chart now called copy of total deaths, it's an exact replica of my previous visualization, but they're completely separate. So any changes that I make to this map are not going to be affected on the other. And this is crucial and important when you're working on different projects. And now what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna show you this very quickly, is I'm gonna bind instead of coloring by um, deaths, I'm gonna color by population. And I'm gonna make a couple of changes. I'm gonna call this, whoop. Sorry, I went away for a sec there. Total deaths, I'm just going to do population. And I'm gonna change the title very, very quickly. Total population per state. And edit the legend title again. To custom, whoop. Not the points legend, but the regions legend, total population. Okay. And I'm going to go back into my story editor right here. And to add a new slide, I simply click on new slide, choose a visualization. And here I'm going for total population. So this is why I wanted to show you this specifically. This is the first map that we've built um, that's plotting total deaths per state in the United States. And the second one, it's total population per state. But these look like almost identical maps. And this is one of the biggest takeaways from today's session. It's plotting absolute values. So if this map is showing population and we have the exact same view as we do with the total number of deaths, which is that California, Texas, Florida, and New York are the darker states on my, on my scale right here, meaning they're the most populous ones, and yet they're also the states with most deaths by um, heart-related conditions. Basically what this is telling us is that this first map is actually not that accurate because it's simply a population map. Clearly, there are, like, there are going to be more deaths in places where there are more people and heart-related conditions are the number one cause of death in the United States. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is not the best representation of your data that you could do. If we go back into our total population map, and I'm going to create yet another duplicate, I'm going to rename this to rate of deaths per 10K. And we are going to go to the third column on our data set, which is rate per 10K. So now if I plot this data instead, we have a completely different story which is that in this case, Mississippi and Alabama are the states with the highest rate of deaths by heart-related conditions. And again, this is really the main point to take away from the core plus map, which is that plotting absolute values rarely is going to be the right answer to your question or to your, um, to your project on what you're trying to do with core plus maps. Generally, you will want to plot rates precisely for this reason, because otherwise the data is going to be skewed and you're not going to be showing actual values or like an accurate depiction of what's going on um, to improve this 
map even further going along on one I did before. I'm going to change again the header of my chart, which is going to be um, deaths by heart related conditions. Per 10K. I'm going to go again to my legend and I'm going to edit this. And I'm going to edit my um, labels. And in this case, I'm actually going to remove the labels and just rely on the pop ups. And I'm going to add this to my story. So now, if we take a look at the very beginning, the first map that we built, we have this total deaths per state by heart related conditions, basically showing California, Texas, Florida, and New York. We compare that to total population per state, and we get basically the same view, meaning that this is really not showcasing the real, um, say, the essence of the issue or the essence of the data that we're trying to plot. But once we look at the actual rate, then we are we get the full story right then here we do get this insight that the data is actually trying to tell us and we can see the elements that i mentioned before we have our base map that is the us we have our different regions and we have the color the numerical color um, of our regions based on our data we have our context provided by the header the source and the color legend right here and we can see how this legend actually dynamically is moving depending on where am I positioning my pointer. And if I click on a specific state, I reveal a pop-up with the name of the state and the rate. So now we move away from regions, we focus on points, and we're going to be recreating this um, stunning map on the earthquakes of the 21st century. We're going to go now into the symbols sheet. We're going to take a look at sizing our symbols numerically, at coloring or points categorically and adding custom colors. And we're going to add legends and overwrites. We're going to go deeper into customization. And last, we're going to take a look at the limits of this particular template. So let me jump back into the editor. I'm actually going to close. So I'm going to leave them open. And I'm going to simply go back to my Flourish and creating a visualization. And for these, we're going to be using the earthquakes um, data sheet. So if you have that at hand, just like, you know, grab it and go to the projection map um, starting point, or sorry, rather the projection map template and the world starting point. And we click on that. And very similar to what we saw with the US, here we have a map of the world with pre-populated data. Um, and in this case, we're going to go into the data set. And we're going to do something similar to what we started doing with the US map, but we're first going to get rid of the color by in the regions, because as the name of this map suggests, we're actually conveying information through points, not through regions. All the action is going to be happening in the points sheet. So first we clear the sheet and we do that by clicking on the little arrow and clear sheet. And we're going to upload our data. So upload data, earthquakes.csv, open and import. And if you're doing this from Google Sheets, for instance, you can copy and paste your data from other sources, Excel, Google Sheets, anywhere you have your data format, you don't need to upload it directly. You can simply copy and paste it. So let's take a look at our data here. We have a column for our year. We have a timestamp with the complex date. So year, month, day, and then the timestamp. We have a short version of our, um, of our date. So year, month, and day. Then we have the location of the actual event, so the earthquake. We have a latitude and a longitude. We have the focal depth, which is how um, how far into the earth the epicenter of the earthquake was. We have the magnitude of the earthquake in the Richter scale. We have a bin, and then we have the magnitude as a category, so like as a proper as text, not as a number. So. As I said before, Flourish will do its very best to grab your data and interpret it, but it doesn't always get things right. And this is a great example. It grabbed my sheet, it grabbed the values that it thought were my data, but it just simply got it wrong. No need to panic, we're going to solve that in a second. But this is just to tell you that sometimes you might get very weird maps at the very beginning, but this is easily solvable. We need to bind the column bindings correctly. 
So for my name, I need to go to column D, which is the location name. For the longitude, I grab my longitude column, which is column F. For my latitude, column E. And before we color in size, we are just going to take a look at what is happening right now. So this is essentially a point map, right? Like I don't need anything else. Maybe yes, the title and the actual source, but this is effectively a point map. We've located every single earthquake that has occurred between the year 2000 until January 2023 into the earth. And we have already some telling insights, like there are a lot of events happening around this area. Um, uh, yes, like around this area, the Pacific Ocean, a lot here in South America, Chile, um, Mexico, but also California. We can see here also in Alaska, like we already have a lot of information. A couple of things that we can do right now um, is actually go to the points layer and start messing around with the settings so we can improve this map even better. So you can choose between circles, spikes, and arrows. In this example, we're not going to cover arrows because in this case, they don't really have the data for it. And that is a more advanced um, map type. So I'm just going to focus on circles and spikes. You can choose whether you want to plot your data one way or another. That depends on you and the story you're telling. I'm happy with circles. The radius, if you don't have a value to actually size your circles, circles by, every circle is going to have the same value. So I can make them bigger, for instance, by increasing the number or smaller by decreasing it. I'm quite happy with two, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Fill opacity is the actual shading of my circle. So if I make it zero, it's going to be fully transparent. And in this case, I would just have empty circles. And if I make it fully opaque, I'm going to have completely solid circles. If you have a lot of circles and a lot of points in your map, I would not recommend you have a 100% opacity because then you're not going to be able to actually see underneath. So perhaps something around like 0 0.3 might not be a bad shout. And then we have the stroke width, which is actually the little border of the circle. You can set it to be zero if you don't want to have it and you would get this sort of like semi-transparent um, aesthetic, or you can set it to be fully transparent or anything in between. I'm going to keep it with the 0 0.75 and you can even give it a custom stroke. So right now they are going to pick up the same shade as the fill. If I change the fill to, for instance, this hot pink, the, um, the stroke is also going to keep the same shade unless I take custom stroke. And in that case, I can, for instance, make them something very, very weird, like this blue, electric blue, and I would have this weird combination. And I can make them as thin as I want, so 0 0.1, for instance, if I want them very, very thin or quite thick, two. Oh, sorry, value cannot be greater than one. My bad. Um, so for instance, 0 0.8, if I want them a bit thinner, and so on and so forth. But I'm happy with custom stroke, so I'm going to leave it like that. Now, back to the black shade. Now we're going to color this um, depending on our data set. So if we go back to our data, we want to color them by the magnitude category. So here what we want, where we're expecting, is to see different dots color by the magnitude of the event. And that is exactly what we have here. So now we can see how we've generated a legend. And in this case, we have a different um, swatch for each of the categories on our data set. Categories are the following, light, moderate, major, strong, grade, micro, minor, and no data, which are the different categories of earthquakes. And the colors are being, again, sorry, let me set this to be noted very quickly. And the colors are being parsed through the points layer, the palette, which is the default flourish palette. Again, if you're in a company, maybe you will see different colors depending on your theme. Um, but we are going to edit this in a second. Before we do any of that, um, I'm noticing that this legend is actually not in the right order because earthquakes go obviously from great um, or even major, I think to minor or micro. So in order to fix that, I'm actually going to go to my legend tab and I'm going to custom over override, custom order override, sorry. And here we can provide a specific order of the different categories in our data 
So they appear in a particular order in our, in our chart. In this case, I'm going to follow the order of the intensity of the scale. So I need great, major, strong, moderate. Um, I think that I need light, minor, micro, and no data. And now we can see that something happened here, which is that I had a no data and it's not popping up. And that is because I actually did not write it correctly. The um, this setting is case sensitive. So this needs to match exactly the same values as you have them on your data set. If I, for instance, type grade with a lowercase g, it's no longer going to appear. And we don't want that to happen. So make sure that you're typing this exactly as they are on the data sheet. Now, if I go back to the file that I sent you, we have a little file called colors.rtf. That should be a text file. If there are issues opening this, do let me know because I can provide this in the chat. But effectively, here you have two different color schemes that you can color your points by. I'm going to be choosing the Viridis color scheme. So I'm going to grab all of this, copy the whole thing, going back into my editor, and I'm going to be heading to the points layer. So in the points layer, we have this field right here that says custom overrides. This is going to allow me to parse any color that I want to color the dots however I want. And in this case, I'm just going to paste that information. And now we have the points color in this particular color scale. The way this works is I'm giving it the name of the category I'm coloring by, which is set in my template by color by right here. So column J. So anything that is within column J. Um, can be picked up by the template and then I can give it a color and that's how it's going to color the point. And then I provide it with a hex code, which is a type of format to kind of like set, tell it how I want it to be colored by. I don't know how to explain that in a second, but it's just a six digit um, hexadecimal um, value, an, al an alphanumeric value, sorry. And this is telling the template how I want my colors to appear. Now we can notice here that no data, for instance, is in this very obnoxious blue. So I'm just going to show you how to do your own override. I add the name of the category, and then I'm going to make it gray. And there we go. The value CC, CC, CC is going to actually make it this light gray. This would be a complete version of a point map. Actually, the one thing that I would like to do is again change the footer and make this the actual source, which is the US, um, the USGS, the US Geological Survey. And this would be a final version of our first iteration of this map, um, which, as I said, is a point map in which our points are all sized by the same value. There are no differences in here. One really cool thing from the Flourish projection map template is that this legend is actually completely um, dynamic, meaning that if I actually click on it, I'm going to be deselecting points from my map. Completely interactive. And now I can only see, for instance, the earthquakes that have a magnitude of great. Now I'm seeing the earthquakes that are magnitude of major and great, and so on and so forth. And this is really, um, really powerful and helps you with um, your um, storytelling. So now to transform this into a proportional symbol map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the data and I'm going to add a size by value, which is going to be the focal depth. So I'm going to be coloring the dots based on how intense the earthquake was, but I'm going to size them based on how deep the epicenter was located. If I do that and go into my map, the view is completely different right now because obviously my points are now scaling up and down based on my data set. If I go to my points layer, now I'm actually able to provide it with more information. I can say that my minimum radius, I want it to be one, meaning that even the smallest dot in my data set is going to be plotted with a value of one. And maybe I want my maximum radius to be something bigger, maybe 18, that might be a bit too much. How about 15 or say 13? You can play around with this, so you can adjust the size of your bubbles however you want. And now if I hover over each one of them, I can take a look at my pop-up, which contains the name 
of my event, so where it was located in this case. Major, it speaks to the actual category of the earthquake and the focal depth in kilometers. The last thing that I'm going to do in the case of this map, I'm going to quickly go into the legend. You can see how these added a new legend, a size legend right here. Um, so now the reader can actually take a look and understand what's the scale that the bubbles are rendered as. If I go to legend, I can do a couple of things. First is the orientation. I can choose whether to plot them side by side or on top of each other. Vertical is on top of each other, horizontal is side by side. Personally, I prefer this much better because I think that is um, um, easier to, to view and understand. I'm going to add a title that is focal depth. Oh, no, that's actually in, that's actually magnitude, sorry. Magnitude. And for the point size legend, there we go, focal depth. And in the case of the, um, in the case of the point size legend, I can actually tell what's the proportion I want from the small to the big symbol. So if I do, for instance, 0 0.1, this is going to be a bit more, more smaller and maybe this legend is going to be more useful because then people can understand the difference between a size 10 versus size 100 um, in my scale. Last thing I'm gonna do, I can go to my regions layer and I can change the fill, so the color of this map. I can set it, by default, it's going to be this minty green but I can set it to be, for instance, a lighter gray, something like this. And last but not least, now we can see that I have pop-ups on my bubbles, but also my regions. And I don't necessarily want that because maybe this is a bit overbearing and like um, overpowering also for the user. So if I go to pop-ups and panels, pop-ups and panels for regions, I'm going to set them to be none. And now I don't get pop-ups for the different regions of my map, only for my little bubbles right here. And that's it. Now we have, we went from a point map to a proportional symbol map. But what happens if I decide that now I don't want to color by the magnitude, I actually want to color um, by the magnitude, by the, um, the actual text category. What if I wanted to color by the magnitude, like by the value, right? Well, first thing is that I'm not going to be able to actually color by that column, it's column H. The template is not going to let me, it gives me an error because this column is numeric and projection maps don't allow you to color points numerically. This is very important. You can click on this little one, two, three icon and I can change the type to text because I'm very stubborn and I want to actually color this by the column H. I'm not going to take a no for an answer and I'm you know, dealing with this. Now, if I do this, I change this to be text, meaning that it's no longer being interpreted as a number so now every single value in here is going to be interpreted as its own separate category. If I go to my preview, I completely messed up my chart because now the template is interpreting every unique value to be a completely separate category and it's coloring every bubble with a different shade. So if I wanted to create a sort of linear scale with my points in projection map, I wouldn't be able to do so. Luckily, we are able to do so with the 3D map and it is exactly what we're going to be doing next. Let me actually fix that again. So now we can see how the chart is looking and I'm going to, back in, going to go back into my slides. And I am realizing that I have not a lot of time left. So I'm actually going to double check and ask if it's worth for me to go over with the next example. If people want to stick like a little bit um, longer than the actual full hour, or if I should cut the session short. I'm not sure what people want in this case. Let's do it, Mafe. We already had some people <laughs> specifically for an animated map. So let's continue. Those that need to jump can do that. Apologies for slightly overrunning, but of course there will be a recording. So let's yes. see what you have in store. We do aim to post um, the recording for the session by the end of the week. So. Again, I'm so sorry um, for overrunning. If you couldn't stick along, um, you will get it by the end of the week. We'll get us an email as well. Make sure to be subscribed to, the, um, to our newsletter to get all this goodness and all the information on your inbox. And it's also going to be on the webinar um, page and we will share links for that. So no worries at all. And let's just then carry on with mapping. But again, just as a quick recap, we've done all of these things, right? We took a look at plotting, plotting our data with a symbol sheet, 
sizing our symbols numerically, coloring our points, adding the legend overrides. And we even saw the interactivity within the actual legend. You know, I can even click on this here on my slides and take a look at that. Um, we saw a little bit of the customization and we saw also the limits of the projection map, which again, as a recap, is the fact that I can't color my points numerically. But yes, we can do so with a 3D map and that is exactly what we're going to be doing next. And not only that, but also we're going to be creating an animated map with 3D map. And here we're going to be taking a look at adding data to this brand new template because so far we've been sticking with projection map. So now we're moving to the 3D map. Um, as I said, coloring points numerically. Then we're going to choose a base map. You have a lot of customization options with 3D map. And we're going to change our points from actual points circles into the heat map, which I believe was an answer, um, sorry, an answer, a question that somebody had in the chat earlier. We're going to add some animation. We're going to be dealing with further customization and we will set a fixed view with the flourish stories. Um, so for this map, you will need again, earthquake data. And as a little bit of a sneak peek, you will also need your GeoJSON. So keep those two files at hand and let's get started. So there we go. Oh, and perhaps just very quickly um, to bring the whole point again of projections home, if I change this into a very, very, very weird projection like orthographic, for instance, this is what I'm going to be left with. And this is again to convey the point that projections really do affect how we see um, the data, how we interpret the data that we're plotting and how our maps completely can shape shift from one view to the other. So again, I do invite you to experiment with projections, to create different projects, to play around with it, but also to keep in mind how they can um, alter your data and alter the perception that the user has of your data. So quickly, I'm just going to name this point map so I don't lose it. And I'm going to go back into my template chooser tab. So I'm going to go a bit further down in, temp in the template chooser and I'm going to go to the 3D map section and I'm going to select the animated points as my starting point. So I click on that. And this is a very similar template to what we saw with the projection map, but it has a few differences, namely in the data sheet. So here we have regions, and in this case, it's empty. I'll explain why in a second. We have points exactly the same as in projection map. We have lines. In this case, we have a couple of um, disputed territory spine. So if I, for instance, zoom in here, this is what that um, this is what that sheet is actually doing. And then we have the inside map regions, um, which is something you can do with 3D maps. I'll go over it in a second. So you can add a little globe of the earth to the corner. So you can give the user a little bit more context as to where you are in the map in a specific point. First, I'm going to clear this and I'm also going to clear the points. And notice that I don't have anything in my data, right? At this, at this point, regions, points, lines, and inset map region, everything's empty. And yet I have a full flat map in here. And that is because, and let me just make this a bit taller, even slightly taller. Um, that is because the 3D map template comes with different um, base maps. So if I have a map, a vector map, I'm going to always have this view of the earth and I can select from different themes. I can select from different themes that are pre-populated in here. Even this one that allows me to select two colors, um, however I want, whatever I want to choose. More options in here. But effectively, I am parsing only the data for the points, not the data for the base map. That is one of the main differences between this and the projection map. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for the flourish dark in this case. You can choose whichever one you like. And now let's find our data. So if I go to the data tab and I go to points, upload data, and I'm going to go back into earthquakes.csv. So the same file that we had before. Let me import and select my columns. So um, the bindings are going to be slightly different from the projection map because we have other options here as well. So first and most importantly, I'm going to go for latitude and longitude, column E and column F. F. I'm going to scale my points based on the focal depth. And I'm going for F and color. So 
before I even go into color, let's take a look at what this is doing. How is this looking? I can already see in my map all my points correctly located. This is looking fairly similar to my point map, so I know this is all correct. I can zoom a lot, something you can't do um, with this level of detail in projection map. And I can even explore different areas to see the different events on each of them. But now let's do what we couldn't do with projection map, which is actually color by a numeric value. So let's take a look at H. I remove this. So if I go into my map, this is looking again, fairly similar to the other map. And we might think that it's a mistake, but no worries, this is going to be solved in a second. If I go to my points um, section on the settings, um, on the settings area right here. And again, let me make this no theme. I can select between the scale type. And right now it's picking up categorical, meaning that again, it's trying to color every single one of my dots um, based on the unique value that it has, instead of considering them part of a whole range of values. But if I switch that to numeric, this is what we couldn't do before. This is what we were not able to do automatically with the projection map template. And now I can do more things with this. For instance, I can choose to reverse the scale because I'm dealing with a dark background. I'd recommend actually going from darker to lighter. If you're plotting on a lighter background, it makes sense to go from a light shade to a dark shade, because generally you want to show the values that have the highest magnitudes the most. But in this case, because I'm going on a dark background, I may want to go from darker to lighter, highlighting then the values that are bigger with the lighter shade. For the palette, we're not going to be using the overrides that I provided, but the ones that are given within this template. So I can choose, for instance, between magma, or Inferno, which are very, very common um, charting palettes because they are the wide variety of colors that they encompass. But I'm going to go back to Viridis, which is the one that I particularly enjoyed the most. And we can do a couple of things here. Similar to projection map, we can get a default size, meaning how big we want all of our points to be. So I can make them one if I want them to be smaller. I can make them five if I want them to be slightly bigger. I'm going to set them to two. The min size, I'm going to set to be one and my max size, maybe 220. And again, you can adjust this depending on your data, depending on what you want to show and what you want to highlight. But I think these values are all okay. Now for the point opacity, we can make it, we can make it 100% opaque or we can make it for instance, 75% opaque if I really want to show that bit of transparency and just let them breathe a little bit and I can see what's underneath. I can add, and I'm trying to look for that here. Mm -mm -mm. The outline, by default, there's not going to be an outline, but I can add it. If I set it to be auto, the outline is going to match the color of my bubble or fix if I wanted to have a specific color. I'm going to set them to auto and make them fully opaque and perhaps just a little bit thicker. Okay. So, one of the biggest advantages, this is already, this is exactly the same map that we had with the projection map. But now we're going to go to the particular, um, the particular characteristics of this template. So one of the great um, things we can do with it is to animate the points. So if we go to our data, we have a short, it's called short data, um, sorry, short column, column number, it's column C. And this has the data format for when the events occurred. So I can bind that to my start time and that is going to animate the points in my map. And I'm going to be seeing the events as they happen chronologically on my timeline right here. So binding a column to the time setting will give you this animation, but it also gives you this timeline at the very bottom. And you can see this counter at the very top. So a few things that are worth mentioning here. You can interact with this. You can, for instance, count the number of events or plot the number of events per month, per week, or per year. And I'm going to show you how you can control that in a second. And we can show the rate or the total. So the total is going to be the increasing aggregate of events over time. In this case, I'm just going to keep stick with the rate and to the month, I believe. If we go to counter, we can either enable or disable it. In this case, I find it 
slightly um, distracted, so I'm just going to disable it. And if we go to timeline, we have some options to go through. A couple of things we can do to make sure that this map is as sleek as possible and it looks um, gorgeous is we can change the visibility and the settings for the timeline right here. So if I go to the bottom, graph visibility, if you don't want it, you can hide it or you can show it. The height is going to determine how tall this is. I'm going to make it quite small. I'm going to make it four. You can make the lines in this data curved or not. So if I show you the month, perhaps that looks a bit less aggressive than the harsh pointy lines. The playback button, you can change how this looks. I'm going to very quickly um, make this match the settings right here. Just very, very quickly. Like that. Timeline duration is going to set how long you want the timeline to go through. The less you do, the less um, the time, obviously, the quicker it's going to go by. So if I set it to be five, for instance, it's going to go very, very quickly over all the events. I'm going to keep it to the default 15. And now here on aggregation rate interval, this is where you can change if you want to show the week, the month, the year, and the totals. So for instance, for custom, in this case, I just want to show the months, no years. And in this case, I just want the rate, not the total. So now this is going to go smoothly on its own. And a couple more things that we can do to the chart. I can edit the background. So if I play with this, I'm going to change how this is looking. And I want it to blend with the chart itself. So I'm just going to make it the color of the chart. I can edit the axis slightly. So let me just find that. Advanced axis settings, if I click on here, and I'm going to make the axis color a very light gray. And to tie it all together, I'm going to go to my layout, color, background color, currently set to be white. I'm going to set it to be the exact same shade as the ocean in this case. And now you can see that I have this more blended in sort of visual that almost connects the map to um, the timeline itself. So it looks very, very nice and very, very sleek. Now, again, another of the advantages that the 3D map template comes with is that I can actually change the way my points are displayed. So for instance, I can make them look like pulses, meaning that they're just going to appear in like this sort of concentric um, circle um, aesthetic. Again, the circles that we're showing right now, which are just going to appear and disappear as they um, render on the timeline, or, and I believe somebody asked for this earlier, it's the heat map. So the heat map is a very particular type of map which focus on density, right? So in this case, I'm not showing individual points, but I'm showing the collection of points and how they aggregate. So this is incredibly helpful in this particular view because we are able to sort of see what are the areas, what are the regions that are mostly affected by earthquakes. And we can already see some patterns, right? It's like, again, we see a lot of events happening here in South America, a lot happening here in like near Australia, Indonesia, and I wonder why. So to tie it all of this together, let's go back to our data and import the last piece of the puzzle, which is our JSON file. So as I said, JSON files are just like, JSON is just a way of sorting data. Don't think too much about it. We do have a lot of resources going over GeoJSONs and JSON files, which are incredibly helpful for data if you want to plot your own regions or add um, like line layer visualizations. And I think Luisa is going to also share a lot of um, information on this in the chat. But for now, let's just upload our data. So let's update our tectonic plates.json. And I mean, the name of the file is already a big spoiler, but this file, essentially what it has is the boundaries of the different tectonic plates on Earth. So what we need to do here, we have a geometry column, which needs to be bound to geometry. This is all correct. And then we have the series, which should just be the name of the line really. So in this case, I can just um, bind column C and that is going to be more than enough. And now if I go to my preview, I can see these lines right here, which again are, are the tectonic plates. These are the areas in which 
the different plates of the earth are clashing and moving and obviously causing this outburst, outburst of energy, which are the earthquakes. So it is no coincidence that we have a lot of incidents happening in this area when we have one line here, one fault. We have another fault right here, a very active area. If you are a geography aficionado, a geology aficionado, you probably know all about the Ring of Fire and all of these um, situations and, um, and yeah, fun facts. And well, most recently and quite sadly, the Turkey and Syria um, collusion or like the earthquakes happen around this area. And you can see how there is a collision of two plates right there. So it sadly makes sense that there were a lot of outbursts of energy um, now in February. But you can get all those layers of extra and extra information through this added layer of information, which is the lines layer. So now we can quickly style that by going to the lines and we have the default color. This can be, again, any color that we want. We can make them red, we can make them blue. We're going to keep them white. And we can make them a bit thicker, a bit thinner. If we make them five, they're going to be extremely thick. I'm going to go for a two or something. And for opacity, we can make them a bit more transparent. So they're just more muted. And at least they just get like this. Um, they, they give us the idea of where the faults are, but they're not super overpowering. So I do like this idea of making them not fully opaque. And you can make them dashed or solid, and I'm going to keep them solid. And this is it. This is our final result. This is the final animated map with a timeline plotting all the earthquakes from the year 2000 until 2023, the end of January. And the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to learn how to actually add a fixed view. This is setting a specific zoom level on stories. And this is going to be super cool and actually very useful to you. So again, quickly adding a name, animated map. And we're just going to jump into a story. We quickly create a story. And the thing with stories uh, is that you are able to actually, again, just let me make this bigger for a sec. It's too squished. Yeah, something like that. The great thing about stories is that they allow us to create like unique views of our maps, specifically with the 3D map template. So if I grab this particular map and say, for instance, set it to this default view, and then I duplicate it, and I want to pan over this region, for instance, and I increase the zoom. And then I create another duplicate, and I move all the way to, say, Europe. I focus on this area for now. And I create oops, not a new slide, but rather a duplicate of this. And now I pan all the way to South America. And maybe focus on this. Now, if I go back to my first slide and go over this, it's going to smoothly animate between the different areas on our map. And this is something only you can do through the story. So your visualization, if I grab my animated map, right, and I open it, and you know what, maybe I find the perfect setting and I say, I think I found the perfect frame and I think this is exactly where I wanna focus on, like it's this region. If you set it like this and then you refresh the page, it's not going to save the location. It's going to go back into its original state. So the way to do that, the way to make sure that your map keeps the frame that you want, it's actually through the story mode. So that should be here, there we go. So this is the way to do it. If you want to focus on a specific frame, um, you would do it through the story. And the last piece of the puzzle would be to actually set this to be an auto-playing story. If I make the navigation style set to none, so I don't have any captions above it, and I make this an auto-play story, meaning that this is going to loop on its own without me doing anything. Animated map story. Now, if I publish this and I go to my preview, this is going to be the final result. Anything I miss a step? No, there we go. So every five seconds, which I believe is the timeline that I added for my slides, it's going to go over a different area of the map, as I said in my different slides. And if I set it to loop, it's going to go and start over and over and over again, almost as a never ending gift, so to speak. 
Um, and you can embed this, for instance, in a Canva presentation, you can embed this on a website and you would have that very, very cool animation going on. And, and it's just a really it, like stunning way of actually conveying information and showcasing your maps. So that was the end of the session. I know it, it, it's been a lot. So let's just very, very quickly go over a recap of what we learned today, um, which is we learned that maps are used to showcase spatial data specifically or primarily whenever your data set has a spatial dimension. If that is the most important thing you want to show, a map is the way to go. We learned that maps have a base, have symbols and regions and legends. Um, we learned all about core pleth maps and why it's important to plot rates rather than absolute values. On point maps, we learn um, about latitude and longitude and to position points. For proportional symbols, the importance of position and size. Then you've also hopefully learned that you can add headers, legends, sources, and pop-ups to your maps, as well as the story animation for the last one. And you could see two of the five different templates that Flourish has in store to plot maps. Again, the slides and the recording for the session are going to be available by the end of the week. Um, these are some of the resources that, we, that I've gathered in the slides, but I'm sure Luisa has shared many, many, many more. Again, we thought of the session as an introductory or like, yeah, like a sort of starting point to get you excited about maps and to learn the basics of mapping, but there's a lot more to cover. Um, so again, we don't have by all means all the documentation of all the things you can do with maps in here, but yes, the most important parts. Thank you so much.